Hi everyone, thanks for joining this talk on managing a GitHub organization where I'll go over some tools, tips, and best practices that were useful for us when we got started. My name is Mark Matias, I'm a software engineer at Qualcomm Technologies Inc. where I work in the software content compliance team. We provide tooling and support around open source compliance and distribution. Here's some of the topics I'll cover today. Um, quick intro on how we got started, a process and workflow we developed, documentation for best practices and guidelines for internal uh, employees to use and then uh, some tooling that we, we leveraged along the way uh, build automation and publishing and then branding and landing page uh, and uh, metrics and analytics for uh, your org. So how did Qualcomm Innovation Center get started on GitHub? We started working on github slash uh, dot com slash quick about 18 months ago uh, engineering teams working on things like machine learning demonstrated interest in engaging with the open source community on GitHub. We also, around the same time, had partners uh, that wanted to collaborate on GitHub. So we, we realized we needed a, a process around this. Quick has been contributing to open source projects for a long time, but we never had a central location for projects that we own. Um, so. So this was a, 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 new, a new effort for us. Uh, one thing that, that actually helped quite a bit was identifying a, a champion, quote unquote, project that helped move things along. Um, it, helped, it helped push, uh, push us through hurdles and get, get, uh, get buy-in from leadership and legal. Uh, for us, it was the AI model efficiency toolkit, which became our, our first project on GitHub. And you know, as the saying goes, if you build it, they will come. Once we got that one project on there, we started to get a whole lot more interest as other engineers uh, started to, to know about, uh, about this and, and we started to get a lot more requests and it just grew organically from there. So easy, right? Just create a GitHub org and, and you're done. Um, well, to, to do this right, you're gonna need resources, time, you're gonna need help uh, to maintain this. So the first thing we did was develop a proposal and plan and circulated that uh, around to get feedback and buy in at different levels. Uh, here are some of the things that we had in there. Uh, use cases, driving factors, why we're doing this, what would be the process and workflow for engineers and legal, um, documenting all the management tasks that, that we anticipate having to support. Um, and, and then what kind of tooling we're gonna have, what, what kind of tooling is available for us to use, and, uh, and then, yeah, and then LOEs and, and resources. What, what's our level uh, of effort for this? How long, how long is it gonna take, or how much time is it gonna, how much effort uh, to stand this up and then maintain it in the long term? So first thing we did was discuss and set up a framework with, with legal on how to process GitHub contribution requests. This will most likely be the long pull in the tent uh, of, the whole, of the whole process and getting this set up. But once you get legal on board and they've developed their own internal process for handling these kind of requests, then everything should fall into place much quicker. Here's um, a workflow diagram that describes the overall process. So an uh, employee submits a ticket for legal business and marketing review. Uh, upon review and approval, the employee is given guidance for project scope, repo names, committer IDs, and open source licenses and notices. The employee direct is directed to review guidelines for project structure and governance. We have this internal repository that has best practices, guidelines, and, um, and tooling, that, that sort of thing to help help them get started. And once all the review uh, is complete, the ticket is handed off to the GitHub ops team, and then we can go ahead and create the repo team, add users, all that. So in an internal GitHub repo, we documented all the operational tasks and requirements to be met when actioning requests. So we set up a dedicated ticketing queue to track requests and communication with, uh, with engineers. When requests come in, we vet the request, um, 
you know, the requests are linked to a, a, a legal open source request, so we can go check it out, make sure that it's uh, approved and within the guidelines. And we also do some checks like ensuring the users have GitHub accounts and they're, they have the correct committer IDs per, per the guidelines. It's a fairly manual process for us right now, but um, I think that's something we want to further automate and, um, and have a tighter integration between the, between the two or three different systems. Like I mentioned, we have an internal uh, GitHub repo for, uh, with resources to aid engineers uh, in preparing their project for open source. The repo describes the overall process for open sourcing uh, repos for, in GitHub, uh, but also provides requirements and guidance on how to prepare the project. It lists best practices, uh, for example, files to include in the repo, and we also have commit guidelines. Uh, information like, um, you know, if, if an internal project is being released, then, um, you know, you got to take some care to make sure that the Git history is also compliant. You may, we provide some, some scripts and information on, you know, squash merging or, you know, the, the history or, or potentially uh, rewriting some of the history to make sure the right committer IDs are in there and, and that sort of thing. Here's a, a sample of some of the requirements that we have for, for ensuring best practices. Uh, a license file is required with a well-formed OSI compliant license, a readme file that references this license file, but also has instructions uh, on how to build and test the software, or at least a link to maybe a contributing file, which explains how to contribute, uh, which includes uh, the DCO sign-off, which will We'll go over in an a, a upcoming slide. Uh, a, con a code of conduct file as well is required. And then we uh, also require copyright and license headers to be present in every source file, including SPDX identifiers, short identifiers. Um, we recommend not having any executable binary artifacts and also having a test suite and some sort of continuous integration using uh, GitHub Actions or equivalent. So I mentioned um, the DCO, which stands for Developer Certificate of Orange Origin. If you're not familiar, the DCO is a lightweight alternative to the Contributor License Agreement or the CLA. It's just the way that contributors can certify that they wrote the code or that they otherwise uh, can submit the code that they're contributing. It requires um, all commit messages to be signed off. So if you see here on the right in the screenshot, you can see an example, a commit message. There's just a signed off by line at the bottom of your commit that has your name and, and uh, your email address. And you can, you can add this uh, by simply passing, passing in a dash S flag to your git commit command. And so to enforce this, we use uh, DCO GitHub app, which is installed globally at the org level. So this is applied to all uh, repos in, in the org. And it requires a commit messages to contain the signed off by line and ensure that the email address uh, there matches the commit author. Um, this has worked fairly well for us. There's, uh, we ran into a couple issues, one being that squash merges swallow up that you know the DCO the, the signed offline uh, so we've disabled squash merging in our repos um, but furthermore the DCO is not a first-class citizen in github so when merging or committing uh, from the UI you can't specify the DCO and it and it you know so you could introduce a commit that's missing that's missing it but um, those requ th that feedback has been provided um, back to GitHub. Uh, another tool that we use is called RepoLinter. It's a project uh, hosted by the to-do group uh, from the Linux Foundation. And this tool lints open source repos for common issues. You know, and, and so things like you can see here in the example, it checks for license files, readme files, contributing files, and it's fully customizable. You can provide your own rule set and have it check for your own types of patterns. For example, we have it check all the source files for a, a specific copyright pattern and SPDX license identifier. 
Um, and we have a GitHub action that runs uh, on, on PRs. So new relic created the, uh, the GitHub action for repo linter and it was recently forked into the to-do groups org which is now the official version so thanks to new relic for getting that started it works really well um, so what we did is we added an org-wide github workflow template um, so you can create these templates in a special repo uh, called dot github which you place in the in your org and when you go to your uh, to a repos actions tab then this uh, you can see here in the screenshot you get this suggestion from from github like hey do you want to you know install this this action so this allows for an easy one click install uh, from 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 the actions tab um, we 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 only added a little bit so our our we have our essentially our, our we have an action that wraps this the 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 new relic action that that's on the to do groups org now but it checks for a local repo lint json rule set if not present it uses our default one um, so we wanted to allow for some custom customization uh, depending you know depending on the project depending on the programming language you're using or the nature of the project um, we may need to make some exceptions or tweak the rule sets um, so we we check if there's a local one first if not we use the the global default um, that we provide so managing github um, we had some goals initially, uh, so we obviously wanted it to be efficient. We didn't want to have to do everything by hand, right? We want to avoid having to click around uh, a web UI to create repos and add teams and, and that sort of thing. You know, if we wanted to apply a label to all repos, or if you wanted to, for example, disable squash merging, which we had to do recently across all orgs, you don't want to have to do that for every single repo. It's a lot of clicks. Um, we also wanted a workflow that allows us to review proposed changes beforehand. So if we have, for creating a new repo and, and uh, granting, you know, five contributors access, we wanted to be able to um, have a, a review process there so we can have some level of accountability and verification. We want to be able to track these changes so we can easily revert or if we needed to, we can audit it. So we want to leave a paper trail so we can investigate problems and that sort of thing, and and yeah, we wanted a, we wanted some we wanted a way that we could view all the repos, memberships, and employees easily, um, you know, one place to go look at all this stuff. So without having to click around um, in, into each individual repo, and if possible, we wanted you know we wanted to do this with some tooling that was easy to use. So our buddy. Kevin at Bloomberg introduced us to this tool called Terraform, which is this open source software tool by HashiCorp. Um, it's an open source tool for managing infrastructure as code using config files. It's generally used to manage infrastructure for cloud operations. However, they have a GitHub provider as well, which, which we've been leveraging and it's pretty awesome. Uh, you, you configure everything in files using Terraform language, which is similar to JSON and YAML. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and we, we configure and manage this in a GitHub repo. So we, we get uh, history for free, uh, history of changes, and we also get a nice workflow with pull requests. Uh, Terraform has a CLI uh, that allows you to preview and apply proposed changes, but also there's a GitHub action. Um, that means that, which means you don't even have to use the CLI at all. Uh, here we have uh, an example from our Terraform configuration. Uh, on the left here, you can see a repo that we've defined. There's attributes and, and some topics, description, the repo name, that sort of thing. On the right side here, you can see uh, a team that we've added, uh, a team repository relationship, and then a membership. We organize files by resource type, but you could organize by project or repo. Uh, we found that that works a little bit better for us when you're introducing a, a new contributor to several uh, teams for example we only have to update one file but also you know if you uh, it's common that the you have the same team apply um, to, to multiple repos 
So it, having it this kind of structure worked better for us. Um, we try to we try to keep uh, or try to use re resources by reference to keep uh, keep the config files dry and, and minimize duplication. And make it makes it easier to maintain. So when we have to update something like if a repo name changes or somebody's GitHub username changes, we only have to update one file, uh, which is where it's defined. So you can see here we try to use IDs and uh, and in usernames and things like that via by reference. Uh, the Terraform uh, command line interface has a couple uh, useful commands, namely plan and apply. So you use Terraform plan to preview changes that the config, that your new config uh, would introduce. So you can see here in this example, um, after, you know, you can see that it created or it's going to create and a new, a new membership here on the bottom and in the top you can see on the left it's going to update a repo in place it's going to update a couple attributes in the description so once you've reviewed the proposed changes and it, it meets your expectations and, you know like it's not uh, destroying anything or recreating something from scratch or, or whatever uh, you can go ahead and run to terraform apply which will then um, apply your changes using using Terraform, which leverages the uh, GitHub API. Terraform allows for values to be declared uh, in, va in variable files that you can then use by reference. So that's how we, we've been managing users. We, we map internal user information to their external GitHub information in a, in a dictionary. And this has been useful for a couple reasons. Uh, one is GitHub usernames can be changed by the user or they may decide to create a new account and, and use that for work. Um, so having this central file means that we can, we just have to change their username in one place and not in every uh, membership that they may be referenced in. Another benefit of this file is that it allows us to run scripts and checks on it. So for example, when an employee leaves the company we probably want to remove their, their right access, maybe not in all cases, but so we can have a periodic task that uh, runs nightly uh, and then goes through, pulls the repo down, um, you know, and parses this file and looks up every employee in, a, in, a, in another system like LDAP and if they're no longer employed, uh, we can then open a ticket for ops to, to, to follow up on. Um, there are or there is a Python parser for the Python or for the Terraform language. I think there's uh, other, they support other languages as well, but um, so this means you could load your configuration into, like, into a dictionary in memory and then you could read from it, write to it, that sort of thing. That's something that we, um, we haven't really explored yet, but we want to do more of in the future. I mentioned Terraform has a GitHub action, so this has worked really well for us. It helped automate and, and streamline our workflow. So once we get a request to maybe, for example, create a new repo, uh, we go ahead and update the config file, uh, add the new repo, attributes, description, topics, uh, whatever the user provided. And then we can submit a pull request with those changes. The GitHub action will run Terraform plan for us and add a preview uh, or the output of that into a comment of the PR. So you can, you can see there in the screenshot, the, the top screenshot, there's a little show plan section that you can expand and it has the output of that. Uh, the reviewer can then approve. Uh, once they, uh, you know, reviewer approve it, they can merge it and then Terraform apply is run by the action and GitHub is updated and the local uh, TF state, Terraform state is also updated. So that has worked very well for us. Teams on, on github.com slash quick want to make uh, artifacts available, Docker images, code packages. Uh, they want to make these available to the open source community. Um, you know, these things help a lot of people get started quicker, developers, but also they can be used to speed up downstream automation. Uh, you know, future PR checks that depend on, on, on some build that can take a long time. You may want to have a Docker image to speed that up. So we leverage Docker actions um, to, to, um, to provide some of these workflows and you can run them on merge, release and, and other and several other events. 
here's a diagram to illustrate an example. So a quick engineer, uh, maybe they publish a new release on, on a quick repo, that'll trigger a build. Um, the, that there's a script or Docker file there where it will pull in third party dependencies maybe, build, uh, build a new image or a tarball or a package. And then once that's built, it'll publish it to either um, you know, GitHub packages or even as a GitHub release asset itself or to some other artifact server like JFrog's Artifactory, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, and then the artifacts can be consumed by developers and any downstream automation that you may have. In terms of branding, uh, you can't really do much on the GitHub org page. We, you know, we added a logo uh, and the URL, but um, the engineering and marketing teams really wanted a landing page where they can highlight relevant and recent projects, provide more information uh, and resources and, and other links. So having to support this, I wanted something uh, easy and, and lightweight. Uh, having used Jekyll in the past, uh, using GitHub pages in combination with Jekyll came to mind. Uh, Jekyll uh, is a, is a Ruby-based static site generator. So um, you, you, can, you can have layouts, you can, um, you, you, know, you can have your content in markdown files, so there's some formatting there. And, and then once you run it, it generates a complete static website for you. Um, so using that with GitHub Pages, which is free for public repos, um, and, and as long as you don't want to update or change the default domain, uh, works really well. So for us, um, we, we, we just use the default domain. So we have quick.github.io. However, you can have a custom domain um, and have it work with GitHub Pages. And it, all this lives in a repo, a GitHub repo. So again, we can leverage the PR workflow there, allows for easy updating and review of changes. Here's a couple screenshots of our uh, quick.github.io landing page where we can showcase our branding and some uh, descriptions and uh, some information about Qualcomm Innovation Center and also highlight uh, some, some new projects. Healthy open source projects are important to, to keep your, the community engaged. We wanted to avoid you know, having stale projects and, and, and ensure uh, responsiveness, responsiveness in terms of uh, issues and pull requests that come in. Um, but how do you, you know, how do you measure this? Um, how do you act on it? And that's where uh, we turn to Chaos, which is the Community Health Analytics Open Source Software Project, the Linux Foundation project. And um, what they do is establish standard metrics for measuring community health. They produce open source tooling for analyzing community development. And, uh, and specifically, one tool that we've been leveraging is uh, Grimoire Lab, which is a tool set uh, built on top of Kibana um, that, that allows for us to look at software development analytics, it collects, aggregates, and visualizes data for, from, from open source projects within our org. So here's a couple sample metrics um, you know, that, that I like to look at activity. So pull request and issue creation trends over time. Uh, how long does it take for us to respond between a creation and closing of, of issues and pull requests, you know, time to respond, and then uh, growth and retention. Are we attracting new contributors and retaining existing ones? So there's several different me metrics that, that you can configure and use. Um, and we're, we're still in the process of evaluating what's important for us, but um, I think these three are good. But yeah, take a look. In the future, so yeah, what's next for, for Quick? Um, we want to further simplify the process for our users, adding self-service options where we can, uh, eliminating some of those manual cross-checks that our ops team are currently performing, uh, allow for new contributors to be more easily added, for example, via UI or something. Um, and we want to make project metrics more accessible to project maintainers and, and provide some actionable, uh, actionable feedback there. And of course, we want to onboard uh, more projects. We got about 30 projects right now, and we keep getting requests every week for new projects. Here are some resources, uh, some links uh, 
The to-do group provides some awesome documentation, uh, and so does uh, HashiCorp on Terraform and the Chaos community as well. So that's all I got. Thanks for attending. Um, feel free to shoot me an email or, or if you have any questions or comments, and I'll be around to answer uh, and talk to people in a, in a Slack group at a predetermined time after the talk. So thanks a lot. Bye.